Welcome to Sunday evening Bible study. We're in the Gospel of John and have been for a good while. And we're down to the last chapter in John chapter 21. A most interesting chapter with a lot to say about it. We have covered the story of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John. And of course, the Gospel story starts with the fact that Jesus was born, like the rest of us, born a woman. And he died, he was buried, and he arose from the grave on the first day of the week. And we have covered that first day in great detail. And now we come to the appearances to the disciples. And this, of course, is the last one that's recorded in John. And Jesus appeared to seven disciples in Galilee. And in this appearance, we have this, what some people call the miraculous catch of fish, where Jesus came to them and they, he told them to put the net in on the other side of the boat and they got in more fish than they could pull out of the water. And then we have this breakfast that Jesus ate with the seven disciples. And we have this conversation whereby Jesus restores Simon Peter to his place of leadership in the church, which really he had forfeited when he denied Jesus. And we also have a statement about the future of the beloved disciple. And we'll, I'll go into that, but I'll point out now that the, that the beloved disciple, whoever that was, we still don't know who it was because he's never identified in any book. And he's only called the beloved disciple in John. And there's only speculation about what the meaning of that is and who it is. And I will tell you that the speculation has centered on John himself. And that's a whole nother story. The 24th verse of chapter 20 begins a kind of a summary that closes the story. He's talking about Thomas. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And this is one of the appearances of Jesus to his disciples. And so apparently they told him about that appearance. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Well, that is a rather uh, strong statement about a disciple who had seen all the signs that Jesus did as far as we know. And so now he says, that since all those signs have been fulfilled, he'll never believe. Well, this is the state of the church that John is trying to explain to you. And that is that the crucifixion, death, burial of Jesus Christ unnerved the church. And they could not figure it out why it had to be. And they didn't want to believe it. So they did not believe it. Eight days later, this is verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. Well, they apparently had a meeting place where they gathered. It was inside. And so Thomas, it says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my 
and put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Well, there's a lot to be said about that. There's been a lot of discussion about the doors being locked and how Jesus got in there. Some said that Jesus was a ghost, and it's even in the Gospels that they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus is quoted as denying that he's a ghost. He has flesh and blood and bones, and ghosts don't have that. So, and also when Jesus appeared to them they had reason to be scared to death no man had ever appeared to them before from the dead and they were seeing him and they didn't know what to make of it and so Jesus said in these times that we have so far he, his first word was peace and this is the same announcement that the angels gave when he was born and that is why he is called the Prince of Peace. And they expected the Messiah to make a war and to conquer the enemy and to make the righteous people the rulers of the world. Why they think that you can rule the world and be righteous, I'm not sure. But that was their dream. And so he said, peace be with you, which upset everything that they understood. And then he said to Thomas and uh, this is Jesus had a way of confronting disbelief in the church and he put he just put it right straight to Thomas everybody in the room and John says that he said to Thomas and you can know that he's looking straight at him and Thomas is sitting there with wide open eyes looking and saying oh, oh what is the next he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, and I have it in accented words and underlined so that you can understand that that's what John meant for it to be. Because I will say, that the theologians pretty much agree that this is the main point of the whole book of John is that the one that was born and the one who died and the one who came back from the dead and the one who addressed Thomas was his Lord and his God and this is the confession that everybody else ought to make in all generations and all times so this confession by Thomas is not just the confession of one man. This is the confession of all, all believers of all time. Y'all got any questions about what I just said? I'm telling you, there's not a stronger statement in the Bible about Jesus than that. And I could go here and give a class on this for the rest of the night I've got to give the class on the rest of this and not just that. So I'll leave it at that, but when you have questions, I will attempt to answer them. And Jesus said to him, after he said, my Lord and my God, and I've emphasized how high a theological statement this is. It's pretty near perfect. If you want to describe Jesus, that's fairly near perfect statement. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And this is how the mission of the church today operates. Jesus gave these disciples, he had already given them a commission before, but this time, He's really giving it to them. And he is saying that they have got to spread the gospel in such a way that those who have not seen, as Thomas had, and yet have believed. This is a message again for the ages. Chapter 20, verse 30. 
And this is a statement that concludes. This is a statement that concludes John's message to you. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. The all understand the importance of that. Now, I'll, I'll introduce some ideas here. First, we know that the books of the Bible were written in a timeless sort of a fashion in the sense that they are for all time, not just one time. Now, there's that to think about. Here's something else to think about. And that is that they were written for the ones that had them in their hand and read them in that day. These words were written for them in their day. I personally don't believe that there are writings in the Bible that to be interpreted that they didn't understand and that now we who have got 20 centuries or 21 centuries behind us in history that we understand them better than they did. I can tell you that they had a rule about what they would use as scripture. And one of the rules is that they had to understand it in their time and it had to make sense to them in their time. If it was gibberish or over their head, they didn't accept it. Do you all understand what I just said? This, these sayings, they understood. And these sayings, we also can understand. This business about many other signs, well, you can project into history some of the controversies that have happened in the past. And those controversies in the church started both from within the church and from outside. The church has always had these outside critics. I mean, I've, we have talked here about how the disciples were accused of stealing the body of Jesus and so forth. Well, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples and some of them are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And those books were written maybe a generation before John appeared. And some of the things that are in those books are not in John. And so when John was published, can you imagine that there were critics that said, well, hey, this Matthew said this happened, and John doesn't talk about that. So you have an argument there about what's Scripture. Well, we accept what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote, and we accept what John wrote. And there's, we don't accept that there's a conflict but they were written by different people in different times and different places to different churches and under different circumstances and I might add under different controversies. And so this statement right here, I'm suggesting to you and the theologians that have spent their life studying these problems would like for you to know that there are signs that are not in John that are in other places, but they are not written in this book. Y'all see that statement? They're not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This is a wonderful statement of the purpose of the whole book of John. And there are those who say that the writer of John's gospel actually concluded the book with that statement. And if we didn't have anything else, that would be a pretty good conclusion, but we got something else. And that something else is what I'm going to get into tonight.
here's one of the things that happened that's not necessarily in John in the 20 chapters. Matthew 28 verses uh, 1 through 8. Now after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Well, there's that message of peace. Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Well, that as he said is a reminder to us that the disciples had heard him say over and over that this would happen, and they didn't believe it because of their preconceived notions about what they'd read in the scriptures. Uh, we suffer for some of the same things sometimes. He is not here for he has risen as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Well, that see it I have told you is the word of an angel. And uh, I remember that story about uh, Zacharias that the angel appeared to him and told him he would have a son in his old age and he, he learned really quick to not say it's an angel. And so the angel here says, See, I have told you. Well, this is not in John, the first 20 chapters. And so there's been a lot of guessing in theology about what this means. And it could mean that some people said that the book of John is not valid because there's nothing in those 20 chapters about Jesus appearing to the disciples in Galilee. Well, you've got the 21st chapter and there it is. If John, the 21st chapter, was added as a lot of them think, then that's one of the reasons why. If it wasn't added that way, at least it explains about Galilee, and that's what we're going to have in the 21st chapter. Y'all got questions about what I just said? So we're at chapter 21, and this is about Jesus and the seven disciples to whom he appeared in Galilee. And this is a vastly different picture than you would gather from Matthew. The angel said, tell his disciples that he'll, you'll, he'll see you in Galilee. Well, we find that this wasn't 12 disciples. It's seven. And I'm going to go over here who they are. And that's you're going to find that that's unusual. After this, well, that after this, could be an addendum to chapter 20 which kind of closed things out this is all the signs but this is a sign after this Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias and he revealed himself in this way you see I've put in uh, large print there uh, I've accented a couple of phrases one of them is the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is called the Sea of Tiberias only in two places in the New Testament. Here and in the sixth chapter of John. And as I go here, I'm going to bring up the sixth chapter of John big time because of what the early church said about it and what all this means. 
And this chapter, you, it, do y'all understand that I've told you that this chapter is probably theologically strongly linked to John 6. Now y'all got that? All right. The Sea of Tiberias is only called, instead of the Sea of Galilee, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. And how long had Tiberius been the emperor when this was written? Well, Tiberius came later. Uh, Jesus had already been born and was growing up when Tiberius became the emperor. And so Tiberius is kind of late on the scene. And they renamed that lake for Tiberius and, and named us, built a city and named it after him. And all that, that is a kind of a later thing in time. And John, of course, is the last of these gospels in time. And that's just one explanation of why he called it the Sea of Tiberius rather than the Sea of Galilee like the others. And then he revealed himself. Well, this doesn't say that God revealed him or God sent him. It says he revealed himself, which is an interesting piece of theology. The risen Lord is not the same in that sense as the one that they knew that was a man sent from God. You remember Jesus kept saying, I was sent from God. A man born of woman. This man, whoever he is, who is the Lord and God, is revealing himself. That's a significant statement here. So, verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin. I've got the NIV open right here, and it calls him Didymus. Well, that's the word for in the in the old language for twin or a double. Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Well, who is that? Well, we've heard of Nathaniel before, but I'm telling you, I'll just go on and divulge the secret right now. He is not one of the 12 apostles. What? I mean, uh, Matthew said, tell him and he'll be two of them and then what? It, this is Nathaniel? I can't explain that. I'm showing you what's in the book. And it says the sons of Zebedee. Well, that's James and John, of course. And two others of his disciples. And you'll never know who that was. And I, I know of one theologian that complained that because of that verse right there, we'll never know exactly who was the one that Jesus loved. It could be one of the sons of Zebedee, which we think it is, or it could be one of these two others. And whoever it is speaks up in this chapter. And so it has to be the one that Jesus loved has to be one of those seven. Do you all understand that? And we know it's not Peter and so forth. John 6, 1. Now this is the relation to John 6 that I mentioned. After this, now there's that after this again. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Well, now there it says the Sea of Galilee, not Tiberias. Which is the Sea of Tiberias. Oh, oh. I told you it was in there twice, and there it is. So named only in John's Gospel. I threw that note in. That's not in the text. And I also threw in a note that it's in there two times only, which I've repeatedly said. And so it's by the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee in the other Gospels. And so Jesus revealed himself again. And in chapter 21, we're coming to it, verse 14, it says that this is the third time. Well, that's a curiosity because there's people say, well, he appeared here, 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 and here. You can't make that number work. Well, all right, John says it's the third time. 
So Simon Peter is named first again on the list. He always is. And then Thomas called the twin. And this, you see John 20 and 24, it says now Thomas is one of the 12 called the twin who was not with him when Jesus came. So he was not present in some things, but he was at this thing in the sixth chapter. Nathaniel of Cana, a disciple, and then the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and the two others. So here's a list of the 12 apostles. And you, I've got Nathaniel out here on the right, you see. He is not on that list of 12. That is a quote from the 10th chapter of Matthew, verses 2 through 4, a direct quote. The names of the 12 apostles, well now wait a minute, are the, are the 12 apostles and the 12 disciples the same? Well, in this case, there are seven disciples that are not the 12 apostles. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Now we come again to a controversial thing. Have you ever heard a sermon on this subject where Simon Peter was really called down for saying I'm going to fish it Simon Peter verse 3 Simon <coughs> Peter said to them I am going fishing well there's been plenty of sermons about how he shouldn't have said that he ought to have been tending to the Lord's business and so forth well I'm going to take the position with you that there's nothing wrong with a fisherman that wants to go fishing and says I'm a going and so they said to him, well, we'll go with you. And I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that. They didn't know that Jesus was going to appear to them. They were waiting, and, and while they're waiting, they decided to go fishing. And the fact, the fact even that they were together shows you that they had not gone their own way and busted up company just because Jesus had disappeared from their sight. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Well, you have these phrases like this, and it raises the question, what in the world did Jesus look like that they kept saying, we don't know who that is. Well, you can interpret that in a lot of ways, and I don't, I don't intend to make a definitive statement because I don't know either. But it appears to me that Jesus kept saying, it's me, I'm the real thing, and they, they just wouldn't believe it. They couldn't, and, and this is one of those cases right here. Now, you can explain that day was breaking and they, couldn't, they didn't have proper daylight, but I can tell you that daylight comes really quick over there. It's a different situation than here about how it comes. And on the, on the Lake of Galilee, it's known that when that, when that sun starts, you can see. But uh, others explain that, well, there's a mist that comes up off of that thing at, daylight, at daybreak, and that may have confused them. And it says here they were only 100 yards out. So I'm not trying to be confusing. I'm trying to explain but it does say that they didn't know it was Jesus. But there's another reason for that phrase, and I'll show you what that reason is. John 21 and 5. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now I've done a little bit of word study here and I, every time I do this, I, 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 I make sure that I tell you that I'm not gonna give you an exam about these words and I don't expect you to memorize all this 
but I want you to be familiar with the usage of words. It's important. And the first word up there that I've got is children. Well, did he really call them children? Well, <clears throat> the word is uh, pahideon, which is really not the word for children, but it's it came to me in an immature Christian. But it does mean kids or lads in this case. And so he called out to them something that was not strange to them. Lads or could you even mean Christians? Do you have any what? Well, uh, what's the word for fish? Look down there at E on the bottom of the page and you'll see the word. It's ichthus. Okay? That's the word for fish. That's not the word that Jesus used here. You see it? That's it in the Greek right there. Prosphagion. Do you have any prosphagion? What in the world is that? That's not ichthus. That's not fish. So what is it? Well, it's... Uh, I've seen one translation that where it's translated the word meat. Jesus asked them, Do you guys have any meat? Well, it means fish meat. And it's talking about boiled or broiled fish that you take and eat on bread. I mean, they could have translated this thing where it says that there was a fire and there was fish and bread on the fire. Uh, it doesn't say so, and I don't want to be making any jokes about this, but what Jesus apparently had on that fire was well, they ate fish sandwiches. The bread and the fish, y'all get it? Well, they don't say a fish sandwich here because there's a theological reason that has, was really pushed in the ancient church. You, None of you have probably ever heard a word of some of the things I'm going to bring up about this. But in the ancient church, it was brought up and talked about. And the difference is in the words. And the first word up there, Jesus said, do you guys have any fish meat is the question. And they said to him, no. And so you have this miraculous catch and it's what's the emphasis here is that Jesus started the conversation and he asked them a question and they admitted they had faith and so Jesus told them how to do it and they did that and they got more fish than they could pull in now I'll go on and, and tell you what the teaching probably is here We've been dealing with the mission of the church that Jesus had to reinstall during the time of, the, of those days of his appearances after the resurrection. Jesus had to recommission the church. How did he do that? Well, this right here is the scenario. Jesus asked the question, how are you doing? They say, we've, we're messed up. We're not doing any good. Well, do it my way. And they did. They obeyed God. They obeyed Jesus. And they got a bigger pool, a bigger hole than they could get. Do you all see a point there about the mission of the church and our relationship to the Lord? Well, that's, that's that point. So they did as they were told, and they couldn't haul it in. It says the quantity of fish. You see that I've got fish underlined down there well they did use the word ichthus there you find that a curiosity up there at the top it's you got any fish meat and down below the, they they couldn't drag it all in because there was too great a quantity of the fish well what i'm getting at here is that some of these are the very ones that jesus told them Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Y'all remember? Well, here's a picture of fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. That's the same kind of boats that they had. You could get several men in one of them and they threw out the net and they caught those little old fish there. Those are uh, Israeli tilapias that come from the Sea of Galilee. That's what they look like. 
And uh, I thought I'd throw this picture out. This the picture was made at Magdala, the evil city where Mary Magdalene came from. It doesn't look so evil right there, does it? And what is that, that what is that boat out there? That's a fishing boat. Those people were fishermen too. 21, chapter 21, verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, from that verse, you know that Peter is not that disciple, don't you? It says that that disciple told Peter. So Peter is not that disciple. Somebody else is. And of the other six, one of them is that disciple. And the problem with identifying that disciple is that there's two of them there that are never named. And I, I have seen arguments in, in theology that whoever wrote this meant to conceal the identity of whoever that is and put throwing those two in there unnamed and unknown certainly succeeded in concealing it. Uh, if they had just named those other two, we could have compared all the other instances of that business about the disciple whom Jesus loved and narrowed it down to one. Well, we've got it narrowed down to probably three here, but not one. I, I'm, I'm sticking with John myself. And so let's read on. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And that word is that powerful word that means he's the king of all glory. When Simon Peter heard that, heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. All right, you have got two disciples here that have reacted to discovering that that was Jesus on the shore. I, I call your attention to the two. So now we'll read verse 8. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. Well, it's been pointed out time and again that 100 yards they ought to know that was Jesus. So I, I don't know the explanation of that. But let's talk about the identity of that disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, if it was John which I've got down there, that disciple was first to perceive that it was the Lord. And if it was John, one of the characteristics of John, any time he is mentioned, is John is the one that gets it. When Peter and John ran to that tomb, who got it? It says that John saw that empty tomb and stopped. And Peter just, boom, goes right on in there. And it says that John discerned and believed. And there, it doesn't say at that point that Peter believed. So if it's John, and I think it is, John is the discerner. John is the one that perceives. John is the one that has given us the deepest book on theology, I guess in the whole Bible. I'd say it is. It is a well that no one has ever reached the bottom of. There's never been a bucket let down in it by any theologian that touched the bottom. And you can draw all the water you want out of it theologically, and you'll never draw it dry. Does it sound like it? The way I'm, I mean, am I drawing some things out of here y'all never heard? I mean, you, you can just keep on doing that with John, and, and you can just get, out, get yourself out on a limb if you do some of it. You won't be careful what you draw. So you've got a disciple that's always perceptive and you've got Peter who is always bold and who always takes action. And in this case, he was stripped down. They, they don't admit that he might have been naked, but he was stripped down to, to some little small garment so he could jump in the water and swim. But when he saw Jesus, he wrapped himself up in his clothes and then jumped in the water. Well, that's not the first time that's happened. Y'all remember? Back in chapter 6, he did that. I'm going to bring up chapter 6 here. It's related. But in chapter 6 is where Jesus walked on the water. And so Peter's got to jump in the water too, remember? 
Okay? The man of action. The six disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish. Well, that is symbolic of the commitment of the church. They may not have known what all was going on, but they knew they were sent out, they were told to put that net out and to get those fish, and they were going to bring them in. Is that how the church is supposed to do? How many of us don't know what we're doing when we help drag in that net, but we help, we're faithful. Well, that's we're supposed to be committed, and that's what we are. So you have this net full of fish. Well, Jesus had called to them in the past, in Matthew 4 and 19, I'll quote it. And he said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And this thing about I go a fishing, how many times have I heard that that was an act of unfaithfulness? I say not. I say that their reaction here shows that they were, Jesus trusted them and they were trustworthy. And that's what we're supposed to be. God is trustworthy, and we're supposed to be trustworthy before God. John 6 and 1. I told you I'd bring this up. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sea. And I'm not going to read all this chapter word for word. I'm just picking out some verses. So here is John 6 and 9. Jesus asked, where are we going to get food for all these people? And they said, there's a boy here who has how many barley loaves? Y'all got it, did it? Five? Five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? So they gathered them up. Now I'm at verse 13. I'll skip what Jesus did. And so they've got, this is the gathering. They gathered them up and filled how many baskets? Twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And I want to call your attention to something the early church called our attention to, and that is five plus twelve equals seventeen. Now, how, have y'all ever heard that before? Of course you haven't. We, we don't talk about this much anymore. They did, and they made something out of it. And I'll get there. John 6 and 11. Jesus then took what? The loaves. Oh, the bread. You see that there's bread here? All right. He took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish. All right. I haven't really read what was on that fire that Jesus made, but you're going to find that it's bread and fish. Are you all seeing a link here? The loaves and the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing be lost. So that they gathered up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves. Is that 17? Okay, keep it in mind. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Well, I've got it up there at the headline. Do you, it's not really big enough. But there's a thing in Jewish theology in the Old Testament in Isaiah 25 and 6 that they call the Feast of Fat Things. And Isaiah said there's going to come a time when God is going to give us a feast. And they said, this is it. When he did that, they knew that he was the Messiah. Now listen to this. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain. By himself. How many times have I told y'all that they would not give up the idea that the Messiah was going to take over by force? And they saw that he was the Messiah. This is him. They recognized it. This is him. And then they're going to take him by force. 
I mean, it, it, I haven't read it here, but this is where it was reported that Jesus fed 5,000 men. Well, who was the one that had the fish and the loaves? It wasn't a man. It was a child. And you just might as well know that probably were 12,000 people there counting the women and children. Well, anyway, the, five, the significance of the 5,000 is that that's men. That's a military head count. That's not the head count. That's the military head count. That's different. So this led Jesus later in the 6th chapter, we're still in the 6th chapter, verse 35, where Jesus explained his position. He didn't say, I am going to conquer evil with an army and kill the infidels and kill the sinners. If he'd have said that, the angels would have had to wipe out life on the earth. He said, I am the bread of life. Now, do you see the importance of bread here and the fish? And it adds up to 17, doesn't it? Well, I'll show you some. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And I've, I've got a note down at the bottom of the page. You see it? early Christian art that they have found portrays a Lord's Supper with fish and bread as the symbols. So it meant something. And this is the symbol of the early church. Y'all have seen this symbol before. Well, that's it. John 21, 9, when they got out on land they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Now, do you see how they connected that with what happened back there when Jesus fed the 5,000, the bread and the fish? So Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Now, oh, they've made several statements about this. First is that people have asked well before Jesus was crucified and before anybody believed are there any people in heaven? Well you can take this example right here and, and say that when they brought in the fish which is an example of the net that the church puts out about the lost, the fishing for men when they got where, when they brought that in Jesus was there with the other fish that he had and the bread. Y'all see that point. This is not a denial that those that died before Jesus couldn't be saved. That's not the point. And I'm, I'm not telling you that all this is what, exactly what this means. I'm telling you what the ancients taught from this. Do y'all understand what I'm doing? And I'm going to quote them by name here in a minute. Jesus said to him, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So there was already fish and bread there. And so the disciples were bringing many more. And at the word of Jesus, the disciples would catch many more. That's the gospel. That's the great commission of the church. And the point is that the disciples would gladly bring that catch, whatever they catch. It belongs to Jesus. And I'm afraid that's not true of some of the churches. When they catch people, they want to make them slaves to them. Oh, you got to do this, you got to do that, and so forth. John 21 and 11. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. Well, John, Simon Peter not going to stand there and do nothing. Not him. you talking about a man of action. And Jesus is going to bring that out. In a minute. He hauled the net ashore full of the large fish. Full of large fish. 153 of them. Oh boy. Those that love numerology landed on that one. And I'm going to show you some of that. I mean there was 153. We got to figure out what that means. I've already told you that there's a 17 involved in this, right? Well, 
when we get into 153, you're going to find out what 17 is, okay? And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Well, that's supposed to be symbolic of the unity of the church. And these converts that we bring in are not supposed to tear the church up. They're not supposed to break the net. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Well, that leaves out a lot of conversation right there, doesn't it? I mean, we don't have any word about what the conversation was. So, what is this mysterious symbolism about 153 fish? Well, now, y'all ever heard of Jerome? I've covered Jerome in times past, and I don't expect anybody to remember everything I say, but I've, I've told you who it was, and I'll tell you again. The dates of his life are 347 to 420 A.D. And when the Latin church, or the church of Rome, began to dominate all the other churches, Jerome, who was the greatest living Bible scholar and Greek scholar, was sent to Bethlehem and he lodged himself in that church where Jesus, where they built over Jesus, Jesus' supposed birthplace and he gathered the Greek texts there that were known that he could get his hands on and translated the Greek text into the Latin Vulgate. We call it the Vulgate and it's stood as the Catholic Bible for hundreds of years until recent times. Now, that man was a great man, would you say? Would you say that he had authority about what he said? Well, he also examined that note number 153, and here's his answer. There was this Greek poet, Opianus. You'll see his name there. And that man said that I have examined all the places in the world that catch fish and there's 153 kinds of them. So what does that mean? What that means is that the catch of the church is not limited to one kind of fish. One reason that some of them had trouble believing Jesus is that he, he was supposed to be the son of David, and he was supposed to be the Messiah of the Jews only. And Jerome says that there's 153 possible kinds of fish, and there's 153 possible kinds of people we need to bring into the church, and that, and that represents all of them. And so everybody, no matter who they are, is eligible to be saved is the point. And it's a pretty good point. We don't try to make that point. Uh, you know, we kind of think, well, that's a sure quaint way of doing it. They, the scholars have even proved that, that Jerome was mistaken about the 153. The man said something like 156, and he said 159 in another place. So he wasn't really definite about 153. But anyway, that's what was made of it. And here comes Augustine. Now, Augustine lived about the same time. You see the dates there? They were contemporaries. Uh, Augustine is a little younger. And Augustine was the greatest Christian philosopher and some say of all time. I mean, you check the doctrines that you're taught in this church about the Bible and you may not know it, but you're going to go back to Augustine's interpretation of Scripture that he taught us. He was a great philosopher. And so he had his words mean something. And he was smart enough where he not only was a theologian, he was a mathematician and other things. Yeah, I mean, the man was absolutely a genius. And so he took the sum of the triangular numbers of 17. And, he, and where did he get 17? Well, 10 and 7 is 17. So what is the 10 and the 7? Well, the 10, biblically, is the 10 commandments. And what is the 7? 
Well, it's the sevenfold spirit of God. Have y'all ever told what, been told what the sevenfold spirit of God is? They had all that worked out. And I'll not try to teach it today. But the point is that he found out that there was a ten and a seven that made seventeen. And remember, I've already showed you that there was a twelve and a five back in the sixth chapter. So there's seventeen, and we got to find out what that means. And the point is that the net was not torn. The net would not break, and the net was big enough for every kind. And so here's Augustine's triangle. And that one's a little bit obscure. I thought I'd just show you for the pretty colors. And this one's even better. And you can take 17, and you, stack, you take one dot, and then two dots and then add three dots, and then four dots, and then five dots, and just come on down the rows all the way to 17, and you got a perfect triangle. It's 17 up the bottom side, it's 17 up this side, it's 17 up that side. You take all the triangles around, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so there's seven of them all the way around, and so forth. That's Augustine's triangle, and I, I don't need to push that any further. I just have I shown you, shown you a curiosity from the ancient church. Well, it made sense to them, and they used it, and they believed it. And it, and the point is that it demonstrates that the church is not just for the children of Abraham. John twenty one thirteen and fourteen. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Well, they saw this meal as something that they needed to celebrate, and they did. And to them, I mean, what did we have today? We had what we call the Lord's Supper. It was a remembrance of what? It was a remembrance of of the blood and the body that was pierced for us. What is a remembrance? Can you all define what that really is? I'll give you the easiest and easy, uh, quickest definition I can give you of it. It's, it, can get, it can get into involve theology, but a remembrance is not just a calling up of a story. It is a action whereby you are there. Do you understand that when we did the Lord's Supper today about the blood and the body, it's as if we were there and seeing it just like they did. That's what it's supposed to be. And they remembered the resurrection with a fish and bread meal, okay? It's not an ordinance of the church because it's, Jesus didn't command it to be such. But they decided they should. And so this thing in John 21 was a big deal. Y'all, Do y'all get how big it was? When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Now, we don't have conversation. It says it that they were afraid to ask him who he was because they knew who he was. And they didn't. They were afraid to ask him all, all these stupid questions we'd like to ask. But it says that when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, and he took over the conversation and he directed it to one man. Y'all understand that one man is the subject of this. And this conversation right here is one of the more convert. Uh, it is controversial, to say the least. We say this means this to us. And others say, you guys are a bunch of ignoramuses. Don't you understand that Peter was appointed to be the Pope of, of the church for all time in this conversation? Do you all understand that that is the importance of this conversation as some interpret it? And so... I need to explain to you why they do it that way and we do it this way, don't I? 
when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Well, you thought it was Simon, son of Jonas, didn't you? Well, they, that, their name is John. They, it was Jonas in their language. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I'll go on and read it and then come back. He said to them, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. That conversation is used to justify the existence of the Catholic Church and other churches as they're organized. This is not used by the Baptist Church to justify our existence. So what is the difference? Well, I am out of time, and I'm going to get into this next week. But I will tell you that Jesus has singled out Simon Peter for leadership. It is true. No one denies that Peter is the man of action. The man who's going to get out there and charge the enemy and you're not going to stop him once you turn him loose. And Jesus has turned him loose. I'll tell you that. And sure was the right man to do it. I mean, we've seen him jump into the water. We've seen him charge into that tomb. We've seen him do a lot of things. He, he's a charger. And that's what Jesus needed against the opposition. And, and Peter's the man. But he had to be reinstated. The whole church everywhere knew that Peter had embarrassed himself by denying Jesus not once but three times and John is saying that Jesus has told him now three times that we're forgetting what you did wrong and we're going to talk about what you're going to do right the first time he said you're going to feed my lambs Second time he said, you're going to tend my sheep. And the third time he said, you're going to feed my sheep. Peter was reconstituted spiritually and mentally and actually physically. And I will also add before we close that this is at a time and Paul tells you that don't y'all say in the churches that I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos or somebody else. Well, this speaks of a time and it suggests a time when some of the churches are saying, I'm from Peter and others are saying, I'm from John. And you read this and you'll see that Jesus settled that issue. He said that the churches that are looking to Peter are doing right and the ones that are looking to John are doing right because all of you are looking to me because I sent them both y'all get that any questions before we pray and close let us pray we thank you our father for your word we pray that you will give us insight to rightly divide this word of truth thank you for your blessings to us and teach us to serve you better for it's in Christ's name we pray amen